chapter 5. When my 14th year on this bittersweet earth came, I felt as if I were a man. Jesse and I stood at just about the same height now. My hair was black with thick curls that hung down upon my brow. Whenever I went up on the corner with Jesse, I could feel the admiring glances the horse would throw my way. A few would even joke with Jesse about when would be my coming out date. On these occasions, I would remark to Jesse that I was ready to pimp, but she would only laugh and cap. You think you know how to talk slick? Boy, but that ain't the key. Anybody can talk out the side of his neck. What you got to do is find the key, honey. And I can't give it to you. I can only tell you where to look for it. You got to learn how to sell conversation, baby. At this time, I didn't know what she meant by finding the key. I knew I could think and talk fast. Plus, I knew all the latest slang. You just ain't hip, mom, I cap. I got some beef that sell better than hamburger. The first time I screamed this on Jessie, I don't know if she wanted to slap me or not. She had raised her hand, but I stepped back out of reach. She looked at me sadly. Had I been older, I might have been able to read doubt in her eyes. Pimping is an art, horse son, she told me seriously. There are very few pimps in this world who can really take this title of being a pimp. Just because a man gets his money from a whore, that don't make him no true pimp. Real pimps are really rare. To prove her point, she reached down in her sweater and fumbled around. When she removed her hand, she held a small roll of money. She put this into the palm of my hand, then closed my fingers over the bills. Count it, she said. I'm going to continue to working. When you think I've made enough money, tell me and we'll go home. I counted the $18 on my way to the pig foot joint on the corner. Tony and Milton were loitering around the jukebox. There was a booth full of young girls next to the jukebox, and they yelled at me playfully. I was in the process of convincing the girls to go up to my house so that we could use the bedroom when Jesse entered the restaurant. My back was turned to the door so I didn't notice her. The kids in the booth got quiet. I turned around to see what the matter was, only to find my mother bearing down on me. She stopped in front of me and held out a $5 bill. I didn't know what to do, so I took the money. Her eyes didn't hold a hint of a smile. Just as suddenly as she entered, she turned and retraced her steps without speaking. I felt a little self-conscious, so I stuffed the $5 bill down into my pocket without flashing my roll. The last thing I wanted was for the kids to think I got money from my mother. Tony would know where I got my bankroll at, but they wouldn't, and I had no desire for them to start getting wrong impressions. Had I really understood Jesse's intention, I could have avoided the next incident just by going outside. But I was unprepared when she popped back in the door. She hadn't been gone ten minutes. I stared at her coming across the floor, bewilderedly. I held out my hand for the $10 bill she carried loosely. In a voice that sounded shriller than the one I normally used, I heard myself asking, You ready to go in, Jessie? Jessie had never been ashamed of anything she did, to my knowledge. She knew that she was embarrassing me. This only aroused her sense of humor. It's up to you, sweet meat, she said, referring to the statement I made earlier. She ran her hand through my hair. I'm ready whenever you're ready. I really wanted to stay and shoot bull with my school friends, but I was embarrassed by the way Jesse was acting. Given the choice of staying and leaving, I quickly accepted the latter. Had I been as old and wise as I thought I was, I would have realized that many people would get the wrong impression of our relationship. Being as naive as I was, the only thing that disturbed me was the people would think all the money I handled came from Jesse. Many sly looks were cast our way as we walked out of the restaurant, from older people as well as from young crowd. Jesse had a way of walking that made people think a queen was going past. To carry myself with such pride was my desire. On our way home, Jesse started to cough. 
I held her arm, and she bent over and spit out a mouthful of blood. You all right, Jesse? I'm as well as any nigga woman can hope to be, she answered lightly. For the first time that night, I was glad we were going home early. When we got home, Jesse slipped into a house coat while I fixed some coffee. She came into the kitchen and sat down across from me. She had removed her makeup and with it, the professional air she carried when she worked. I smiled with happiness. I realized that I loved this tall, strange, beautiful woman. She gave me one of her rare smiles. This was an understanding between us that was wonderful. Apparently, Jesse understood better than I that we were all each other had. I went to the cupboard, removed two cups from the shelf, and rinsed them out in the sink. We always took this precaution so we wouldn't have to worry about drinking a roach. I poured us both up some coffee before sitting back down. Without taking her eyes from mine, Jessie placed a small bundle of reefer down beside my coffee cup. It wasn't difficult for me to recognize the ten joints I had rolled that morning. They still had my blue rubber band around them. Leaving them under my pillow had been a mistake. I had meant to retrieve them, but earlier had forgotten. To try and lie out of it would bring down instant punishment by whatever means lay near her hand. From past experience, I knew she wouldn't hesitate to throw the coffee cup at me if I lied. Jessie hated lies with a passion. I stared at the reefer, hoping that my hand wouldn't shake too bad. I reached boldly for the reefer. After removing one from the group, I tossed the rest on the table in front of her. Removing a book of matches from my pocket, I lit the joint and took a deep drag. Jessie silently stared across the table at me. Neither of us had spoken yet, nor was I going to be the one to break the silence. She got up from the table and walked into the other room. Soon the sound of Billie Holiday singing her troubled blues came drifting from the record player in the front room. Jesse returned and picked up a joint and lit it. We sat at the table smoking reefer and talking till the sky began to get light outside. Of the many things she warned me about that night, one was never to use any other drug but reefer. She made me promise that for no reason would I allow someone else or myself to shoot some heroin in my veins or snort it up my nose. I wasn't worried about using horse. I had seen what shooting stuff did to Tony's mother, so I had no desire for that form of drug. We were both lit up pretty well when we staggered up from the table that morning. Jesse had made a short trip down the street and got a bottle of wine to go with the weed. So we had become quite high. Her laughter rang out to welcome the sunrise as I helped her to stand. The flickering rays of the new day played tag across the wall as we staggered towards her bedroom with me holding her up. After I had put her into her bed, I leaned down to kiss her on the lips, but she turned her head quickly to avoid it. I drew back and stared at her surprised. She drew my head back down and kissed me on the cheek. There, you're a big boy now. Save your passionate kisses for your girlfriends. Before I could tiptoe out of the room, she had rolled over and gone to sleep. The following weeks became difficult for me. Jessie continued to hunt me down in whatever restaurant, pool hall, or doorway I had been loitering in. It became so obvious that she was giving me her trap money that Tony remarked, Man, why don't you tell Jesse what people are saying? I stared at him amused. If I knew what they were saying, I'd tell her. He laughed at my reply. Time after time as we walked home from school, he'd look over at me and laugh. We continued down the street, but soon I began to get weary of his humor. The more irked I became, the louder he laughed. A group of boys came through a yard carrying a case of wine they had stolen. It was Head and his gang. He had received his nickname because of the size of his head. It was longer than a football with lumps on the back of it. He was short and wide with a flat nose from too many schoolyard fights. His gang was the only one in the neighborhood anywhere near as tough as ours. 
And because he was the leader, he was always trying to prove how mean he was. They spotted us and stopped. All eight of them were roaring drunk. I realized that this could be trouble, so I watched Head closely. In school, on many occasions, we had started out joking, only to end up talking about each other seriously. I knew that for some reason, Head had a dislike for me. He handed Tony his bottle. I will offer you a drink, horse son, but I don't let white niggas drink out of my bottle. All of us went to the neighborhood movie each weekend, and we had just seen a cowboy picture where an actor had made a similar remark. I grinned at what I thought was his idea of joking and remained silent. Tony took a long drink and then handed me the bottle. Man, didn't you hear what I said? Head yelled angrily at Tony. 